Okay, we are here rolling with uh, a beautiful lady in California, Miss Mary Lou Metzger. How are you doing? I'm great. Thank you for that. <laughs> oh, you're welcome. Nice to have you here and also uh, co-hosting with me. Uh, he's been on quite a few times. I love having him on. And Mr. Brian Edwards, how are you, Brian? Darren, I'm great and uh, looking forward to this podcast very, very much. Mary Lou and I go back a long way. We have some great memories. I'm sure she can share with everybody and it'll be fun. Now, Mary Lou, you spent a long time uh, performing uh, and most people would know you from uh, your time on the Lawrence Welk show. And how many years were you on that? Was it 12 years you were on that show? I came on the show in 1970. It was my Mother's Day. The Mother's Day show was my very first show. And we stopped taping weekly shows in 1982, but then we continued doing specials with Lawrence through 1985. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's, we'll, we'll get into that and uh, talk about that whole thing. I have tons of questions on, on how that whole uh -oh. show was, was filmed and how you went about it. You everything. know me pretty and, well, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you're in uh, California now, right? Yes, Los Angeles, Sherman Oaks, a suburb. Nice day today. Possibly. Yeah, it was lovely. Couldn't have been. Felt like fall. We still have roses blooming, though. What's fall in California? It's like 75. <laughs> what well, can go down? It can get pretty low at night. It's probably in the 60s. Oh, that's rough. The leaves fall from the trees. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We had eight in inches of snow on, uh, was it yesterday? That was crazy. Yeah. Oh, the Our coldest I've ever been was in Canada. It was in Regina. <laughs> <laughs> you walked out the front door and your face froze. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> they uh, they got winter pretty early. We, this is our first snowfall. It's going to be gone in probably a day or two here. Um, but yeah, the West got hammered with snow last month or just a few weeks ago. And there's there's been a bunch of drive in shows happening. Uh, I mean, they're happening all over the place. You drive in with your car and watch a concert. You're just not supposed to leave your car. But they had a couple uh, in the West Coast in October. Um and the one that some of my friends were performing on, minus 20 Celsius. And they had a show outside. <laughs> how could they work? <laughs> a musician, how do, you, how do you do that? I don't know. I wouldn't want to do it. It didn't sound like fun to me. But I guess if you're in your car and have the heater on, that's fine. But if you're on stage, that's a pr pretty chilly night. I've worked some fairs that got cold, but they didn't get that cold. <laughs> yeah. So how things are faring with you with, with COVID and all this that's going on? Um, how are you handling that situation? Is it just you're you used really to it really healthy. Now yeah. Nah, well, I don't know if you're ever going to get used to it. It just becomes familiar, though, to take a mask on your way out the front door if you have to go out. Yeah. But uh, it's amazing how many people don't. So everybody's still kind of hunkering down and now there's a light at the end of the tunnel. So that's encouraging. It's like, yeah. just hang in there a little longer. Do you see when you go out in your area that there's still lots of people just not wearing masks and it's. Not so much, much. anymore. Yeah. It took a while for it to catch on though, but now a lot of the stores and things won't even let you in with that one. Yeah. And if you go to a doctor's office, they take your temperature on the way in. So it's, they're pretty good about everything. Yeah. It's a, uh, it's a different way of, looking at things. I wonder now, once we kind of get out of this, how well that mask situation is going to stay with us. You know, are we going to, that's going to be pretty common for people or are they just going to ditch it right away and just get back to normal? It's hard to say what's going to happen with you that. You may hang on to one for a while. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> just to just the other safe side. <laughs> I think so, especially if you're in a crowd, like if you're going to see a show or um, and a movie theater or something. I think it's you're going to see a lot of people. That's the hardest thing. I have so many friends that are in theater and musicians, and it's just devastated them. Friends in New York, it's it's an entire industry. The people that do makeup and costumes and uh, ushers and box office, everyone's just been just leveled. Yeah, it's pretty sad, especially New York. You think of Broadway and and all those people involved in those shows. Um, there's hundreds and hundreds of people per show. It's, it's, that's not coming back anytime soon. That's, that's a big blow to that city. I mean, I, I can't imagine you, it'd be interesting to see what's going to come back, um, and what's not going to come back. Um, 
Well, and some of those theaters are old, they're landmarks. And Brian, you know, from the some of the beautiful places we've played, you can't socially distance. There's no way. The backstages are small. Yeah. That's it's one of not the, possible. The obvious question was how they were going to handle the restroom situation and all that other stuff in some of these older theaters. You don't have enough room to change your mind, let alone social distance. I mean, yeah. there's just no room. They didn't build them for that. They built it for, they concentrated on the theater. They didn't care about anything else. And and I think that they were right in the time, just not now. Yeah. Mm. So Mary Lou, you're um, a fabulous singer and dancer and, and, uh, I've had a bit of time with you on the road with, with Brian on the Lawrence Welk tours. And I know Brian's been out a bunch of other times with you and, and, uh, but I want to go back before even that and kind of find out what got you to the Lawrence Welk show. And, uh, you know, where did you grow up? I, I, I was reading a little bit it was in the Pittsburgh area. Was that correct? I was born in Pittsburgh, but yeah. we moved to Philadelphia when I was about five. And back then in the dark ages, on Saturday mornings, little girls would either go to the roller skating rink or to dancing school. And uh, I went to dancing school, had a great teacher who had been in show business. She danced with Dick Powell on 42nd Street when she was younger. And uh, she was a go-getter. So she got me involved in some local theater. And when you're doing one thing, you hear about other things. So uh, I worked at a place called the Playhouse in the Park in Philadelphia uh, with some wonderful stars at the time, John Barragray and Betty Field. We did The Crucible. And someone's agent came to see them and said, you know, they need a little girl to go on the road with Music Man for 10 months. Wow. So I went to New York and auditioned and got that. And I was Amarillith for uh, (laughs) 10 months on the road with Music Man. And all over the country, wow. so <laughs> kind how, of like a Brian Williams tour. Yeah. <laughs> <For> Brian, <laughs> Brian Edwards and a Brian Williams tour as well, <laughs> and a Brian Williams tour too. Yeah, yeah. Like, he's not as, he's not as good. But, uh, <laughs> so, how old were you? But that then? was, you know, I had a theater background. That was that was where I kind of cut my teeth was in theater. Yeah, so young on the road for a bunch of months. Um, away from school yeah. and all that stuff. What was that like? I had to make up seventh grade when I came home <laughs> in, a, in a couple of months, <laughs> but that worked pretty well. <laughs> and, uh, and then I uh, did children's television for years, a show called the Gene London show where he would dramatize stories and movies and musicals and we would act them out. And he was an artist, a wonderful artist And uh, then I went to college and there was a show on the air at the time that was kind of like, um, I guess, the precursor to Star Search, that kind of thing. It was called the All-American College Show. And they would come to the campuses and audition people to bring to California to do their show. And they came to Temple University and... They were lovely. They couldn't have been nicer. They said, we're booked about six weeks ahead, but we'd love to use you. And I thought, uh, yeah, don't call us. We'll call you. And that was a really nice way to say that. Yeah. And about 10 days later, I heard from them that someone had canceled uh, on their schedule. And could I come to California? Wow. So my mom rode the train with a local assemblyman from Philadelphia, uh, Bob Hawkinson, and he had gone to college with Myron Florin. Wow. And you couldn't have made this happen. Yeah. But he said, well, oh, she's going to California to tape a show. She should go over and see a taping of the Wilk show while she's out there. I can call Myron and get her in. And uh, it was kind of exciting because my mom and dad had had their first date to the Lawrence Welk Orchestra in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Wow. <laughs> Way back when. Yeah. And uh, so that's what happened. I went over to see the Easter show being taped in 1970. And Lawrence, when I ever saw anyone young in the audience, he would always do his own warm-ups. He would say, oh, do you sing? (laughs) Yeah, I'm out here to do the All-American College show. Mm -hmm. And uh, he handed me a microphone and said, uh, sing something. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and so, no accompaniment, no anything. Uh, I sang How Are Things in Glockamora. And after the show, he invited me back to his dressing room. 
And I was sure I was going to get an autographed picture to take home for my parents. And instead, he invited me down to the Palladium that Saturday night to sing with the band. Wow. Ooh. And um, he asked me if I wanted to do a three-week engagement with them at Lake Tahoe. They would do a Harris Club at Lake Tahoe yeah. every year for three weeks over, th- over uh, 4th of July. And uh, I came out thinking I had a, a summer job for three weeks, and uh, he kept me on. Mm. Not great. <laughs> I, you could never have made that happen if you tried. It was just one of those. It just happened, right? Right time, yeah. right place, all that type yeah. of thing. So how old are you when you went there? How, you, to you the just, Welk show? Yeah. I was 19. 19. Wow. 19. So that must have been exciting. That's probably, was it your first time to California, was it? I had been to California when I was in Music Man. But at that point, I was 10 years old, and it was it was very different from going on a TV set yeah. and being part of that kind of thing. And also, it was national television, and I'd grown up with it because my grandmother lived with us when I was growing up, and that was her hour on Saturday night was the Lawrence Welk Show. My dad taught me to waltz and polka in the living room. Yeah. So it was kind of had a little upping the ante as far as what it was so what was that like the the three weeks you did there in in lake tahoe that it must have been pretty it, amazing it was fabulous because it's pristine setting it's just beautiful there and we were doing two shows a day seven days a week wow but the days were free we did an eight fifteen and a midnight show oh wow and that's uh, not brian's hours <laughs> no. <laughs> no. we're usually back at the hotel by eight fifteen. <laughs> believe me when we yeah i know Matt Nays are really great with the lawrence well crowd and uh but yeah it, it was exciting to be there it was wonderful but i did ensemble stuff i wasn't featured at that point and i remember um maddie rosenhouse who was the sponsor that was geritol and jb williams and all of those different products came up and uh, and he said oh i see you've got someone new in the show lawrence he said Yes, isn't she cute? It's a shame she can't do anything. <laughs> and I always got a kick out of that because as the years went on, whenever there was a train to drive or a uh, animal to walk across, I walked an elephant across the stage. I sang "A You're Adorable" to a a live wolf. One time. Wow. <laughs> so I, I kind of earned my place <laughs> over the years. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> so you finished up the three weeks there. Um, and so did you think that you're going to be maybe a part of the show at that point? Or how did you did transition? He just, he just kept me on. Yeah. It, it was, uh, I went home, I checked out of college, I checked out of home and uh, moved to California to uh, the studio club, which was sort of like a residence for young ladies. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and uh, it was then my, my folks moved out eventually because I'm an only child. And my dad had been offered a transfer. He worked for Gulf Oil at the time. He'd been offered a transfer years before, but I was in college. My mom had a great job. My grandmother was living with us. And he said, no, I think uh, we'll pass on that. And then a year later, my grandma had passed away. I'd moved to California and it was like, okay, I'm ready. <laughs> Yeah, that's a big so, change. So yeah, they are. <laughs> <laughs> so Timing. What were you? What did you roll into college for? What did? What were you hoping to be? I was a music major. Were you? Yeah. Uh, I spent as much time, if not more, in the theater department, but I figured music would be the better background. I'd have more education, you know, with music. I always wanted to perform, though. It was really that was what I wanted to do with it. So. And long-term thinking, were you thinking theater, Broadway is where you wanted to head? Well, being in Philadelphia, the logical thing would have gone to New York. Yeah. It would be to go to New York. And uh, when, but to come to California with a job was sort of opportunity. Grab it. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Well, 19, moving to California, going on the Lawrence Welk show. Um, you must have just been on cloud nine. That's, that's pretty amazing. 
it really was. It was such an opportunity. And the people on the show, especially the women, were like a family. And uh, the audience was wonderful. They treated us like we were their children and their grandchildren. It was it wasn't the distance you have with a lot of celebrities, you know, that are on that you see on TV all the time. It was when someone had a baby, they'd get these handmade booties and bonnets and things. And yeah. or you'd come and they'd if you were in Wisconsin, they'd bring you cheese and the good stuff from the locals. It was just it was such a personal, sweet time. Yeah. So what was a actual taping? of a show like what was it, like your typical schedule rehearsal taping how did that all all flow was it did it change all the time or was it pretty set in stone this is how it worked uh we were at abc studios at prospect and talmage out in california and uh we taped on the stage where the original phantom of the opera <laughs> was filmed wow. and the crew there had been part of the welk show for so many years they they just knew how the routine and what we would do uh, on Thursdays, we would go into a recording studio and we would make a rough track of everything that was going to be on the show yeah. on that the next week. And that way the camera, the director could do the camera shots and all of that stuff. Then, um, uh, Monday, we'd go in and rehearse the group numbers and stage them and have all the costume fittings. Then Tuesday was tape day. We were in at 10 in the morning. And from 10 until 5, we would do camera rehearsal. You'd go through each number two or three times. Yeah. And uh, then at 5.15, you'd do a dress rehearsal. Uh, and we had a live audience for that, for the dress rehearsal. And then we taped at eight, eight to nine. We never stopped tape except twice when, once when the power went out in the whole studio. Yeah. <laughs> and once when they were doing, Sissy and Bobby were doing a dance called to Nickling with the poles and Sissy's foot got caught in the poles. And those are the only two times I've ever seen them stop tape on the Welk show. Wow. wow. That's amazing. The tape, that's what it meant. Yeah, well, even after we were no longer doing the live broadcast, when it was live on tape, it, Lawrence felt the same way. He thought, you know, people feel like they're in on the experience. If Sissy caught her hem, her shoe in a hem of a dress, and she had a mile-long piece of dress hanging off the back by the end of the number, they got to see that in part of it, and okay. But... Uh, so yeah. did the orchestra, um, were they playing live or using the recordings that you did in the studio from before or how did that work? 90, 95% of the time they were live. Yeah. There was an occasional thing if they were promoting a record that had been done, they would play the actual recording. Um, or if the number was too hard to mic with a lot of singers in, in the same area, yeah. then they would use a recording of it. Um, and how, other how did they do that? Lots of times when you look at those shows, there weren't, obviously you didn't have little labs and little things like wireless mics and, and all that. A lot of boom mics or a lot of boom mics. Yeah. Lots and lots of boom mic and all, you know, the, the band was well mic. They, yeah. all the stands and all of that. That's amazing. And hand mics, you know, yeah. there were a lot of people sang in front of the band. So there were hand mics. It's interesting because you, you go back and watch the shows and they all they all sounded really good. I mean, yeah. you know, you figuring the technology back then, it, not anything close to what you can do now. And they really pulled off some amazing uh, things. I mean, obviously, lots of rehearsal, um, lots of prep, uh, like anything. I think the more of that you do, the better off you're going to be. But um, yeah, it always sounded really great. And you just, you know, I always wondered did was part. You, you, you can tell if it some of it was recorded or some of it wasn't or but it it you just kind of look so how do they pull all that off but it you know they certainly did well, I know, and it's funny because when you're doing the show live you're so invested in your own performance because you know you've only got one shot to get it right yeah. <laughs> that you don't really have that perspective of the show itself yeah and now looking back and seeing the shows on public television and things you realize 
that was a fabulous band. And to have that opportunity to sing in front of them every week, oh, yeah. it's just, just a gift. So who decided uh, what songs you're going to do each week? What, you know, you obviously had producers and, and writers and all that type of thing. But how, how did a show get put together? And how much did Lawrence have a part of all of that? Lawrence had a big part in it. There would be a production meeting and it was a Lawrence and Jim Hobson, the director, George Cates, the musical director, uh, Jack Immel, associate producer, Rose Weiss, the costumer, and uh, sometimes sets and lighting would be there as well for those. And they would set a theme a couple of weeks in advance and people could suggest songs, but mostly Jack, Immel, and Jim Hobson came up with the ideas. Um, Lawrence would get his, have his input all the time. And, but Lawrence was the last word on what actually made it and what didn't. Yeah. If, if he didn't like the idea of it, it didn't fly. The buck stopped there. <laughs> it did. And then there was a staff of arrangers. Yeah. And uh, they created arrangements every week. Rose Weiss was amazing, an amazing costumer. I don't know how she did it. Um, I was listening to an old interview with her and she said there was never a show that had fewer than 80 to 100 costumes. Wow, that's crazy. And then you get into the carnival show or the county fair and Halloween and you can just keep multiplying on that. Yeah, jeez, that's amazing. How, how many, many, go ahead, Brian. I was going to ask you, how many people would be involved with the show totally? Like writers and producers and directors and lighting and hair and makeup and all that sort of stuff. Oh, my gosh. Um, there were five makeup people, one hair person. Um, I guess I didn't care about the hair as much. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. Rose was our costumer. We had four dress, well, the probably eight dressers when you consider the men and the women. Um, one woman that did all the alterations. Oh. Gertrude Spangler just was amazing. You literally would go in for a fitting on Monday. And on Tuesday, when you came to start the run through, it was like the elves had come in the night. And what was a piece of fabric the day before was a shawl with fringe on the side <laughs> made into something spectacular. Wow. Um, I, I still don't know how they did it, but it, uh, it took a village to pull that off. I bet. I wonder what the average budget per show was back then. Do you know? Um, I have no clue. Heard. Yeah. That'd be really interesting to know what back in those days, what they spent per show. Um, oh gosh. Yes. It'd be, It'd be enormous, probably. Um, but and the thing I loved, with the exception of two years when we were at CBS, we were always at ABC, even when the show no longer was airing on ABC. And we kept the crew. We kept the same crew. They moved with us to wherever we were doing it. And uh, I think that's one reason they were able to do things so well. Yeah. It was that staff that just made it run like clockwork. And they were as much family as everybody else. We just felt like we grew up together. Yeah. So did you guys have big rap parties after every... <laughs> did, they, did they all go wild? <laughs> <laughs> no, we have to laugh because some of... Lawrence did so many wonderful things. And there was always a beautiful Christmas party. That kind of thing was fabulous. But after all those years on television... I, I don't think Lawrence organized this. I actually think it was his manager that did it. They brought in um, hot dogs and beer from the Wiener factory and brought it onto the soundstage. And after all those years, <laughs> that was our rap party. <laughs> I mean, they were good hot dogs, but yeah. hey. <laughs> There's way too many comments there. <laughs> So what was the filming season? How long uh, did you, how many weeks did you shoot for typically? Well, when I first joined, when it was still on ABC, there were 40 
new shows each season, and then they would rerun 12 of them. And because it was on 52 weeks a year. Yeah. Then when it went into syndication, they did 32 new shows, and then they would rerun 20 of those over the summer. And so we usually taped from the end of August or beginning of September, right in there, up through the 1st of March. Wow. And then we'd go on a 10-day road trip with Lawrence. When we'd come back, we would rehearse the road show that would go to Lake Tahoe. Oh, nice. And then we'd be in Tahoe for over the 4th of July, always three weeks over the 4th of July. And we went on tour again in August for another probably 10 day trip. Wow. So it's, it was really no downtime throughout the year. No, it was, a, it was a full-time job. You couldn't yeah. do a lot of things outside, but you were a lot. One of the reasons they did the pre-recording, you know, tape for on Thursdays was because then people could work other jobs Friday, Saturday, Sunday, right. as long as they were back in the studio by Monday. Yeah. So while the, filming was going on did you go out with Lawrence and do live stuff on those weekends sometimes or was that those weren't with Lawrence yeah. only the only the tours were actually with Lawrence and that was when we were playing places like Madison Square Garden I mean it was they were arenas they were enormous and uh otherwise we would do things like theaters in the round and theaters all around the country and fair dates and yeah. things like that wow so going out live um obviously that's a lot of people how many people would go out with you live to do uh a show i know brian's <laughs> done the taking the show out and there was se several people <laughs> <laughs> well we had a full bus of performers and then there were two trucks oh yeah that that traveled and uh Sets, yeah. sets and that type of thing. Did they make no, a just no costumes, costumes and instruments oh. and yeah. So would you take a lot of the costumes that you had worn on the television show and on the road, like pick different segments and stuff that you would use? Is that how that would work? Yes. Yes. And uh, they would lay out the show and usually the Tahoe show would be the one we take for the most part on the road with an expand, a little bit of an expanded version. Um, so there would be, metal cases, like moving boxes of costumes. And uh, Jack Immel was the associate producer of the show. And he would be there setting up costumes in every new arena, putting name tags. Everybody had their special areas. And yeah, it was, it was not an easy thing, especially when you're doing um, one city each day and sometimes two shows a day. Yeah, that's grueling. <laughs> <What> <laughs> You know that. <laughs> I'm taking notes for the next time we go out. <laughs> <laughs> so on the show, who who looked after who was the choreographer and, and uh, was there multiple or was there one one person kind of looked after that? Bobby and Sissy did their own. Yeah. Arthur did his own. Jack did all the group numbers and he and I did ours. Wow. Yeah. So it's pretty self-contained with that stuff. It was, yeah. Yeah. Always was. So were those long rehearsals trying to uh, put those routines together or is it, did it come to, together pretty quickly? We didn't have a whole lot of time to put things together. Yeah. Um, with Jack and I, we, we were kind of the tap dance comedy team. I mean, I've been the front end and the back end of almost every animal you can imagine. In <laughs> <laughs> we were singing telegram, be my little baby bumblebee. We were bees. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so uh no it was we you sort of got into a system of you thought like you thought like each other and uh you'd pull steps from here and steps from there and come up with something new and then when you had the luxury of rehearsing to do like a new tahoe show or something yeah. then you'd bring a few new things into the repertoire have you ever thought that you'd want to be on dancing with the stars <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know. <laughs> You'd be great at that. Oh, thank you, you sweet talker. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it would be great. You'd be a couple of glasses of wine in them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sure all of them do that. So, uh, 
so on on the show, you must have had a lot of funny and strange and crazy things that happen while you're taping. Uh, you know, always things always happen. There's always accidents or mics falling over or people falling over or whatever there could be. Is there any, you know, particular ones that kind of jump out at you that, uh, that happened while you're taping? Um, that you can tell. I was going to say <laughs> some of these, some of these needs need editing. Well, I know there was a story that happened. It was before I actually joined and it was with Larry Hooper, the, the fellow that sang bass on the show. And he also played piano. So he was going from the band into the production area and he had to put on another costume on his way in. And it was, he only had an intro, one of Lawrence's introductions to do that. And that was back in the day because the production area couldn't be mic'd and he was doing it with the Lennon sisters that, uh, and the girls were such different heights. It was one of those situations where they had to pre-record. Yeah. And Larry didn't make the change in time. <laughs> and there are the girls standing there with this bass voice coming out of the airwaves <laughs> and it was airing live. <laughs> <laughs> but, but there are a million stories like that of, uh, T- lyrics were some of the funny ones. Oh, yeah. uh, I, one of the songs that everybody in the world, I think, knows is Over the Rainbow. And Tanya just blanked at one point and sang somewhere over the rainbow, way up high. And then you saw this glaze go across her eyes. And the next thing you heard was, I'm going over the rainbow. Someday I know I will. <laughs> 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 but we stopped for nothing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's great though. Live television was the best. I love uh, that it's live and there. It's great. Yeah, kind of frightening too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but there's a you it gets the adrenaline going, right? There's something about that that gives you that little extra spark of energy to in your performance. And I think when it's live, you just like all all cylinders are firing and you're you're ready to perform and it's nerve wracking but I think there's always an extra spark of something there when you're when you're doing something live. Oh yeah, and I mean Lawrence was a classic for things that that happened, and when he uh, would read his cue cards, it was uh, and now folks a medley of songs from World War I. <laughs> and I, I actually, in one of my rap rounds, I had the actual cue card, and that was, that was literally ready read. <laughs> wow, that's fantastic! Mm. Yeah, I love. And uh, Doc Severinsen one time was on the show, yeah. and he first introduced him as um, Doc Stevenson, and <laughs> then at the end of the number, he said, "Thank you, Doctor." <laughs> <laughs> You know, I often heard Charlie Pride talk about the very first television show he ever did was the Lawrence Welk show and how it was just a, what an experience. You know, I see that oh. everywhere. It's everywhere you see stuff with Charlie. You see that clip? Yeah, it was just recently on the other day. It was. World News Tonight, I think it was. Yeah, I noticed that. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I think Charlie sang Love Sick Blues. I remember. Yeah, yeah he did. Yeah. Well, he talked about the great experience of being in an actual pro television setting he'd never seen before. So it was good. And you had Lynn, Lynn Anderson was on there too, was she not? Yeah, she was. She was on there when she had Rose Garden. Oh, wow. When wow. that hit. Very good. So obviously, talking there, a lot of big stars on the show. Um, did you have anyone on there that you were just like, oh my gosh, this person? I mean, I'm sure you had that all the time, but was there any special ones that just really... Jack Benny guessed it on the show. Oh, yeah. Uh, it was wonderful. Uh, Henry Mancini was on frequently, and he which couldn't have been lovelier. Uh, I remember I had grown up with my grandmother being in the house. She loved Kate Smith singing God Bless America. And Kate Smith came on the show. And I just thought, wow. Mm. You know, it, a lot of memories. I think so many families grew up. The, the things we hear, used to hear most often when we talked to the audience after the show was either um, – we grew up together or 
my mother made me watch you. <laughs> <laughs> now it's my grandmother made me watch you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that's neat that you, so you would, after the show was uh, done taping, you'd go out and speak and answer questions and that with the audience. We did it more when we were on the road because there was more time, the time element, because they would be using the studio the next day for something else. So we kind of, they had to get us out. But on the road, Lawrence would stay on stage at intermission and shake hands and talk to everybody and then stick around afterwards and visit. And uh, he, that was the thing. When I say Lawrence had the last word on stuff, it was because he knew his audience. He loved them so much and he trusted the input he got, if they said they liked something, you got more of it. And if they said they didn't, it was gone. Wow. That kind he, of dry was it? Good stuff. Well, he, 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 he used his instinct about people, hiring people for the show. But um, he said you have to give the people what they want. Um, if you don't, you'll never make it. And that – that's really stuck with me because it wasn't just a line for him. Yeah. It was from the heart. He had had so many years of traveling before he ever made it. I mean, he was born in 1903 and the show didn't go national until 55. So he was not a young man when he sort of hit the jackpot and made a name on television so I think he really appreciated the people that stood by him and that um, gave him the life he always wanted, that he'd always dreamed of. Yeah. Do you know the story and how he actually got the TV show and how that came together? He was, <laughs> he had been playing at the Aragon Ballroom in Santa Monica mm-hmm. and Someone came to him and asked him, I think it was in 1951, if he wanted to be um, a summer replacement for a show. And he said, I don't even talk well. How could I do that? And then I think they told him what they were going to offer him. (laughs) And he said, we could try that. (laughs) So then in uh, 55, when it went national, they had based it on the following he had, and he always had crowds at the ballroom. They loved him. So they knew he had a following. And a fellow named Jack Miner, who was had the, one of the big Dodge dealerships and was said, you know, we need a summer replacement for Dodge. Uh, how about it? And kind of the rest is history. Wow. Yeah, it's... And I think, you know, part of the charm was that he didn't speak well and he was just this different character. And, and I mean, it it was the whole package, right? If you took any one of those elements out, it wouldn't be the same thing. And he was, he was the real deal. I mean, he'd had entire bands leave him because they said, you can't even speak. Why are we going to stick with you? You can't even speak English. (laughs) Big mistake. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Bad call. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> so, Brian, why don't you tell the story? And obviously, you toured. Yes, eyes open. <laughs> you uh, you toured uh, uh, the Lawrence Welk show quite a bit. What what? How did that collaboration start? And what made you uh, jump in and decide to do a tour with the Lawrence Welk show? I had seen it advertised in Toronto. Henry Cuesta had put together a show. As a matter of fact, Mary Lou and Tom Netherton were on the show with Henry. And I went to see that, and I felt so much of the Lawrence Welk show coming through as if I was watching the television show. I just found it phenomenal. So I come back home, and I thought, I'd like to do that. The only thing I want to add to it, I want to have a bubble machine, and I want to have some clips of Lawrence Welk, and I want to have the Welk blessing with this. So... I flew down to Branson and met Larry Welk and uh, we talked about the show and put, I think it's 25 band members. I think we had or 24, something like that. And we had one, two, three, four, five of the stars of the show, a dance team, the bubble machine. 
the big LW behind it with the video clips and the whole bit. And I sat in Branson and I cried my eyes out. I was watching this uh, rehearsal that was being done of the show. And I sat there thinking, I've, I've made it. I, I've made it. My grandmother would be so happy with me that I got away from country music for a while. I'm in mean, the big time stuff. This was the big deal. And every night at that show, I just felt I've experienced that audience. I know exactly what you're talking about. Long after Lawrence Welk had passed away, that same audience was loyal enough that they were still there. And big, big numbers. We were doing two shows a day every day in those huge auditoriums. And I just felt I got a lot of gratification in them. But the people come up to you and say, I feel like Lawrence Welk is in the building. I just they were able to pull that off. And Mary Lou was the producer of that show on the road. And it was fabulous. You knew exactly how to capture what, what exactly we wanted. I mean, everybody joining hands and, and singing, let there be peace on earth. Every time I hear that song, a flashback comes back to me and watching that audience stand up, and sway back and forth. And God only knows we need that song now, big time. But it, it just left me with a, a, a feeling that I, that I've gone from everything I've ever done that I'd made it. That was, that was the big highlight of my career. I'd worked with a production show that was produced, dancers, singers, lights, everything. It was just, it was great. So there you go. That's my sum up in two minutes how I feel about it. <laughs> you know, Brian, you're the only person that ever got the rights to use the name Lawrence Welk Show. Well, I'll tell you, it was the most interesting meeting I ever had in my life. <laughs> yeah. It was it, it, me trying to explain all this thing to Larry Welk and him looking at me thinking, what the heck is wrong with this guy? Where is he coming from? <laughs> I remember them checking me out. They checked five references out. I mean, two people checked me from, from the organization. I didn't know that. Yeah. They called Tommy Hunter, and I think they were, after a two-hour conversation there, they they finally said, let's get this guy on board. If you don't want another one of these calls. No, they called. <laughs> they called everybody. I mean, it was, it was great. I, I think the thing is that as a promoter, there's nothing better, at least for me anyway, to have satisfaction of looking at something and saying, we pulled this off that we're able to create a memory that people had. And, and, and the, the people out there, um, I always wanted to be part of the audience, seeing what, what all they thought and listening to the way they, they felt about the whole thing. I thought, my God, this is the greatest thing on earth. And it was. I mean, to me, I, I was in cloud nine. And it was, uh, it was, it was, I mean, it wasn't used to shows produced and stuff. It wasn't used to producers, directors and lighting people and all. I just were, we never had that. And I'm glad we did because it was great. What was the first uh, show you did, Brian, with, with the group? We did uh, Spokane, Washington. As a matter of fact, we all flew from Branson. We had a warm up in Branson, remember? And then Spokane to Seattle to Bellingham, Washington, Don't the whole route, Chello Act, I can tell you the whole thing. <laughs> Kelowna, Kamloops. <laughs> Chilliwack, British Columbia. And here's my first date in Canada. And we're in an old arena. And guess what they didn't have? They didn't have any dressing rooms. Now, <laughs> I thought now it was about minus 30 in that arena. And I thought, now, how are we going to pull this off? We had a wonderful bus driver by the name of Randy Bell. He's Randy like, Bell. <laughs> garbage bags up along the side of this bus. And we'll let the ladies come in the bus and change. And that's what we used inside the arena. Do you remember that? I do. You know, and we made all the changes too. We, everything was great. And then from there, right from one end of Canada to the other several times. And it was, I don't know. I just, I, I, I felt like I was at home with people I knew. I felt I'd never met them before, but I felt I've known them for all my life because that show had a way to make you feel like you knew everybody on there. They were all your friends, you know, they really were. I mean, I'm sure how many times have you heard that Mary Lou, that even though you never met those people, they all thought they knew you for years anyway. Well, that's what made it so special. Absolutely. When people would come. One of the best things were the meet and greets afterwards, because people would tell you their stories and everybody had these stories that were so personal. And uh, I remember one gal who was younger than most of our audience and, um, she said that she'd grown up in an alcoholic family and one hour on Saturday night, everyone would gather in the living room and she said, we'd listen to the show. And it felt like for an hour, I had a normal family. Mm, yeah. And you think, gee, or, or someone who had a parent who had Alzheimer's and they said they'd put on the show and they said, I had him back 
for for a little while. You can't, you know, you can't uh, can't make up those stories. They're too touching. I'm listening to those stories out there, and I'm <laughs> somebody says, "Can you take a picture?" I said, "No, I can't. I'm starting to melt." <laughs> You can't because you've got to be the next person in line. As you know, they've got to be as important and get as much attention as the person that you were just with. And they expect that. And that's that's part of show business. But it's it's tough. I mean, I was listening to those stories out there. Like, oh, my God. I mean, it's in there. And it's the heart and soul. I mean, they you know, what I found interesting, too, was a lot of people always expected our audiences were going to be a lot older than they were, because a lot of the kids that were grandkids that were watching the show wanted to come out. It was the only time they had, as you say, with their parents or grandparents. And they come out and say, my mom and dad, my grandparents are sitting right beside me tonight. They weren't even near the place, but they, they got that feeling. And that's, that was good. I just hope they know how much their stories stick with us. Oh, I bet. Yeah. Yeah. There's no way that stuff cannot. I mean, you can't work a television show like that with the family values that it had and not feel that way. You just, it wouldn't, it would never work. I don't think it would anyway. It's, it's one thing in our society that's really disappointing now was with technology and, and everyone sitting on their phone and no one communicating. And, and back then when the show was on, there wasn't an iPad to go to, or there wasn't the internet, there wasn't, you know, you had a couple of channels to watch. And if your parents were watching that, you were watching it too. And whether it was something you wanted to watch when you were 12 or not, you watched it. But when you got older, I think that's when you really look back on how important and how much of a great memory those times were. And, you know, bringing families together and having them sit. And how many times does that happen nowadays where the whole family sits and watches yeah. A, a TV special or even just sits or have dinner together. together. Yeah. Without a whole yeah. hour without looking at and waiting for and see if a text has come in or a message or, or just sit there, you know, even dinner, no one sits and has, has dinner without some form of something happening where you'd have to check your phone or do whatever. And it just doesn't happen. And it's too bad. I wish there was, uh, you know, a time where every day that, you know, between this time and this time, the internet shuts down, everything shuts down, everyone's forced to, you know, spend time together. Um, I mean, it will never happen, but it, it, you know, yeah, I mean, it's, it will get to a but point. But we're starved for connection. We, we really are as a society, I think. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's, it's amazing, you know, and, and you take a look at at the show and and how it's still watched by so many people. Um, it just hasn't disappeared. Um, you know, you can still see it lots of places. And um, and then you, the whole group moved to Branson. Now and, and that was a big um, big ordeal, uh, making the move and and having the theater in Branson and and having the show there and everyone coming there. Um, did you spend much time? Uh, at the shows in Branson? I was there for the Christmas season yeah. uh, for the most part. And one time I produced another show, so I was there for the beginning of the season to get it set up. But I was usually there for maybe the first of, right after Halloween, first of November. And then the Christmas shows ended around December 15th because the weather got bad and it was a tourist town. So yeah. That was my my time every year in Branson was for, for the Christmas show. So that was a fun. I really, I enjoyed that. You were also producing a show in Escondido too at the Welcome Yeah. Show, if I correctly. I did the Christmas shows there. They called it a Welk Musical Christmas. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of fun because I got to design the show. We'd get to have two of the Welk stars and we'd alternate them. Uh, we did it for about 10 or 12 years. And you got to design a show around them because with a television show, there's not a lot of time. People had a number that maybe two or three minutes if you were lucky and had people had expectations. So you kind of gave the same thing over and over again. Uh, it was fun to be able to design a show so that you could see people's different talents and how much more they were than they just got to show on the television show. Yeah. 
it was great. Uh, I had the opportunity, and Brian asked me to to go out on the last tour we did. And it's interesting now going back to a lot of these venues that we went to. Almost every single time we go back to a certain one, Kingston comes to mind. Uh, the crew there, it's a conversation about your show every single time I go there. It's, yeah. it's every single time. And we've probably been there 30, 40 times since uh, we've done your show. Oh my gosh. And even the last time they come in, they'll talk about, uh, and that, and this, these are crew guys. These are rock and roll guys. And, 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 and they, they were, they were so enamored with the show. They just loved every minute of it. And it comes up every time I show up. Uh, and there's multiple places that we went to that, that happened. So, um, it's pretty amazing. I, I think that's pretty great. Absolutely. That, that is, I think there were a lot of closet whelk watchers that we never really heard about, that it wasn't really cool to say, because I remember one time I was in an edit bay working on a, a project for Branson and uh, Prince was in another one of the studios and a couple of his, his guys came in and were kind of sitting at the doorway, looking at what we were doing, said, oh, Lawrence Welk, that was green jello night at our house. <laughs> 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 there you go. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> my my favorite kind of tech road story to tell about being on on the tour uh, with you guys, and I think we were in Swift Current, uh, Saskatchewan. Sure. Yeah, and it's, it's not a big theater. Um, I think what what would it seat Brian in there? Six hundred. How many? Six hundred. Six hundred. Yeah. So we did the first show. I think we did two shows, and uh, of course the horn section never plays quiet um they're always they're always full blast all the time horns you know they're just let her rip so i remember it was the the evening show i believe and it came to intermission and i had a hard time getting everyone's vocals and ev everyone else who were the stars above the horns and and i basically have the horns channels off i mean they weren't even they weren't even up. And uh, so I thought, okay, I'll have a, we'll have a little chat during, inter uh, during uh, intermission. So I went back and talked to the guys and I said, hey guys, could you, you know, do you think we could just bring it down? I'm having trouble getting the vocals loud enough. And, and, uh, and they all kind of just looked at me and kind of gave me a bit of attitude. And, and it was like, no. So, <laughs> so I thought, well, I'll show you. So uh, I just went up on stage and took off. I took away every single one of their microphones and just left the <laughs> just left the cable hanging there. <laughs> and so they all came back for the second part. And I can see them sit down, and they're just looking and they seen there was no microphones, just the cable sitting there. <laughs> and it's like the next show they played quieter. <laughs> I told them so. Well. I had you off. I said, I, th I figured I'd just make the, the pack up a little easier. I just, I just, you know, I wasn't using them. So I just packed them up. <laughs> but there's something always psychological with musicians with playing too loud. If you tell them they're not in the PA or in the sound system, you've turned them off. For them, even though you've told them they're still the loudest element, even though they're not, you know, just the horn by themselves is louder than anything else. If they know they're not in the PA system, there's something psychological about them that they'll play quieter. And it's always been a trick I've used ever <laughs> since. I said, well, you know, I might as well take the mics away or <laughs> it worked and I've used that ever since. Well done. <laughs> well, the good thing about that audience too, if that audience didn't like something, they'll tell you. And oh yeah. I think they knew what they wanted. They come out there, and if it wasn't exactly what they wanted, as far as horns allowed or something, you didn't have to feel it yourself. They they'd be very nicely, but they'd let you know that's not the way it was with Lawrence on that television show, and that's what they wanted. So, yeah, yeah. I remember one time Lawrence, uh, I think it was Tom Netherton, had done a new arrangement of "On a Clear Day You Can See Forever," and he'd had a big arranger in town. It was lots of horns. It was. Da -da 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 and after the thing, Lawrence came back and said, we can't have this. That's like machine guns. 
How was he on the road with 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 sound and volume and all that stuff? Did he ever get twisted up over that, or did he ever have issues with it? Or no, he was he was fine with everything. Um, and the the thing would have made it a lot easier for all of us if they had actually carried our if we had carried our own sound, which we didn't. He used the house sound. And when you get into some of those bigger arenas and you've got the sound swimming and coming back at a little different, it's, Ooh. it's, it's spooky. <laughs> yeah. so you mean they use, the, they use the same system they use for hockey games and all? Oh that? yeah. Oh wow. Wow. <laughs> That's what we said. Wow. <laughs> how are the, how are the monitors in those days? <laughs> Marginal. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh God. But you know what though? Everybody I ever talked to that went to one of those shows, not one of them ever said anything was wrong. They all said how much they enjoyed it. I think. Being no, I the- know. And it, Sorry. and they would sell the seats behind the stage in those big arenas and they would warn them ahead of time. You know, you're not going to be able to see their faces. You're going to be behind them. And they said, yeah, but we'll be closer. Yeah. And they would literally talk to us when we were coming up the stairs to get ready to go up. <laughs> well, it's, it's interesting if you think about using the PA system in the arena and what you are used to hearing from your TV set back at home, <laughs> it probably made the show sound way more like what they were used to, right? Because there wasn't a lot of bottom end. There wasn't a big, you know, big, huge sound. When you turned on and watch the Lawrence Welk show on your TV set. No one had a stereo hooked up to it. It was just little speakers in your TV. Yeah. And if you're using that PA in an arena, it was probably the closest thing sounding to the real thing uh, that you could get. And it probably oh. worked great. I mean, probably wasn't <laughs> great to hear, but uh, for you guys, but. <laughs> well, and one of the things that was so amazing was Lawrence would walk out cold to in these huge arenas. And as soon as they saw him coming, they went crazy. No introduction, no anything. Wow. I, mean, it was, uh, I love that on the show when an artist just walks out and you don't, you don't have to say anything. There they are. You know who they are. You don't need to, I mean, to read a list of 30 things. You just go. So, Yeah, I like that yeah. too. Yeah. Mm. And he didn't have an ego about that. He just loved it. Couldn't mm. wait. Very good. Very, very good. So looking back um, at, you know, your years on the show and, and, you know, lots and lots of great, great memories. Um, you probably look back to the, the day you, you first went to California and, and you can look back at that. There's certain times in your life, you always, there's a crossroad, right? Where your life changes forever. Um, did you ever think at that time, uh, when you went to California and you, you met and then became a part of the show that it would just last for this many years. Never in a million years. Never. Yeah. Uh, but I think I underestimated the way the audience felt about the show. It yeah. was, I was 19 when I came on, what did I know? And these people have still kept the show on public television I mean, I, the big thrill for me was uh, I'd been on the show about a year and a half when my folks had moved out by then. And I actually got to bring my mom and dad down to the studio for a taping. And they got to dance on television on the Lawrence Walk Show. Oh, wow. boy. You know, and you, you just think of so many memories and just feeling very grateful about that. Yeah. Now, you danced with Lawrence at the end of every show. Uh, I did. <laughs> what was, how did that start? What what? Well, that hap- that came about because when uh, it, it used to be a tag dance where people would tag in. Mm-hmm. And then Lawrence saw that some people were like waving to their mom or, you know, just yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he, the, he did. That didn't thrill him. And at this point, uh, <laughs> Sissy had had left the show. And so he said, I think I was next in line that had danced with him on a few things. So he said, no, we'll just let her do it. 
<laughs> but they were they were fun times because he would always talk during our dances. He'd do an underarm term and say, I'm going to catch you. <laughs> He'd do another, I'm going to catch you again. <laughs> so I, I have very, very sweet memories of that. I bet. Go ahead, Brett. So what's happening with PBS these days? The show is still airing strongly and obviously it's doing very well. It's still on. We're in the second year of a two-year cycle. Uh, it's been on public television since 1987. Wow. Isn't that amazing? Mm -hmm. And uh, so just thrilled. Oh, that, <laughs> yeah. oh, <laughs> Who'd have thought? <laughs> so how, how often do you tune it in? I, I watch it whenever I'm home. I really do. I kind of, because I have that perspective now of not being, a, not being, having to perform and do my number and I get to watch the show. Yeah. And sometimes I'm just amazed at how good things were. Amazing. Well, it's stand the test of time, obviously. I mean, yeah. the show that's been off the air for 30, was it 35 years, maybe since 1985, 35 years. And it's still, I mean, I watch the show too. And I look at it thinking, my God. It's it's just it's as fresh as it was then. Yeah, it's fun. It's a it's it's a good show. I think everyone was so talented, and you know we did older songs. We did, you know, things that people thought might have been a little corny, but I think they've stood the test of time and held up pretty well. It's mm, great. How big was the show worldwide? Was it American and you know North American based, or was, did you have a big audience outside of uh, America's? You know, I think, at least according to uh, the stories they told us, we weren't seen anywhere other than the United States. But um, in nineteen in the seventies, we went to Europe, and people, natives, recognized us. So I don't know if they were getting it on Armed Forces Television or through another, you know, source, but. Yeah. I sure ever... why they weren't getting it online. I'll guarantee you that. <laughs> <laughs> they sure they're, they're streaming it for sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, <I'm a> stream. <laughs> <laughs> True. Well, we appreciate all these stories. I have a couple uh, questions uh, I'd like to wrap up on, and it's a question that I like to ask uh, a lot of my guests who perform and played all over the place. And obviously you played places like Madison Square Gardens and all these great places uh, with the show. Are there any venues or places out there you've never played, but you've always wanted to do a show and sing at? Oh, my gosh. I think because of my theater background, I would have loved to have done a Broadway show. Yeah. That makes sense. But I feel like I've... Not this I've year. I've been so fortunate... <laughs> I've been so blessed and so fortunate to have played all the places. And thanks yeah. to Brian, I got to see Canada as much as, as well as the U S. So, uh, I, I couldn't ask for more. That's awesome. And is there a person that you've always wanted to sing with or perform with that you had a chance? If there was one person you could choose that I always wish I had a chance to sing with this person. Do you know who that would be? Uh, gosh, I never thought about that one before. I do. I would love to have been able to do a show with Robert Preston. Oh yeah. I, uh, I remember living in Philadelphia, we'd get tryouts a lot of the time before the shows would go to New York. And I don't even remember what the first thing I saw him in was, but it's the only time I stood at a stage door to meet someone afterwards. And I just wanted to tell him how great I thought he was. And all I could do was cry. <laughs> <laughs> I was just uh, acclimated. <laughs> well, we didn't talk. Uh, you married someone from the show. I did. Yeah. The bass player, Richard Maloof. <laughs> My awesome. gosh. So he played uh, stand-up bass and tuba as well, right? Stand-up bass, tuba, electric bass, guitar on. Yeah. All of the above. Yeah, we've been married for, let's see, 47 years now. Can you believe that? Wow. Believe me, I can't believe it, but we have. <laughs> still going strong. So obviously you met on, on the show. 
Uh, we did. So who pursued who? Pursued who? Oh, he chased me like crazy. Did he? <laughs> <laughs> I, I was, uh, I was just first time I'd been away from home really. Cause I lived at home when I went to college. So I didn't go away for that. And this was like, I was just kind of finding my footing, you know, in the world as an adult. And, uh, it took rich, I think about, yeah, about three years. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. <laughs> I applaud the effort. <laughs> yeah, tuba players aren't really a high on the list of, of you know, rock stars. <laughs> no, no. And especially when you listen to him practice long tones on the tuba, you definitely. It's like, yeah. <laughs> Got to work. The romance a is gone. <laughs> yeah. Has to work a little harder. That's for sure. <laughs> well, Brian, do you have any other uh, questions you wanted to add in? Well, it's just been a delight. You know how much I've always been grateful to be able to have the opportunity to work with you and all the people on the show. And it's just a tremendous opportunity to be here with Darren and be part of it. And uh, can't thank you enough for all you've done for me over the years. It's been incredible. And uh, sure looking forward to many more shows together once we get this little issue out of the way here with our COVID friends and away we go. Ah, yes. Just stay healthy. I love you guys. <laughs> We will. And yeah, thank you again for being a part of this podcast. And I really, really uh, love the time I got to spend on the road with you. And I, I still just remember getting hugs from you. And you were so warm and so I nice. I have pictures. Good. <laughs> <laughs> of the hugs? <laughs> I got to see those. Um, but yeah, no, it it's it's stayed with me uh forever and uh i really appreciate your warmth and and hospital hospitality and you were just great so i just always consider you a friend right from when i met you so it's nice to have you on the podcast here it's great thank you pleasure to be here all right so if people want to follow you uh are you on the socials facebook or instagram or I'm on Facebook, yeah. TikTok? Are you Facebook. <laughs> Are you doing dance moves on TikTok? I'm old. Yeah. <laughs> but on Facebook, people could uh, uh, like you or find out what's going on with you on there? Oh, sure. Yeah. Anytime. Awesome. So make sure you, everyone check that out. And uh, maybe uh, we'll trust Brian. Maybe we'll do another tour someday. Sounds good. Yeah. I'm Th in. <laughs> Thanks again. Excellent. Yeah, and stay healthy, and we'll chat real soon.